on this motor and power this pump according to whatever signal uh, that we're receiving from the building operation. We'll go a little bit more as we get over to the drives. But, uh, as far as the pumps are concerned, uh, these are a right hand rotation on the back end of the motor. So if you ever have to pull this motor for any reason or disconnect the motor when you wire it back, just make sure when you start it that uh, the pump is rotating in a clockwise direction when you're looking at it from the back. Uh, there are arrows, directional arrows. There are some. Uh, on the motor, you'll also see, I believe, on the loop, on the pump end, there's another arrow here, and that's also a directional arrow, so you know which way it's supposed to be. Because of the three phase uh, motor, yes. which is a uh, reverse rotation. Yeah. This can be reversed, so if you swap to right, the right, right leads, okay. yeah, so, um, yeah, and then uh, you have your uh, coupler in there, it's basically oh. two hubs, and on the inside is like a insert, like a rubber insert that's got some gear T5. Um, as far as maintenance with that, there really isn't a whole lot to those. Um, one thing that you do want to kind of, when you're going around and come in here and check things out, uh, one thing you do want to look for is you'll see kind of like a black dust, black rubber dust, and it'll start building up around this area here. You can see like a pile of that black dust and you have an issue with that. Yeah, there are four grease ports on these pumps. There's two on the motor, there's actually two on this bearing assembly here. Uh, we recommend, since we're only using them, these for heating, I believe. I don't know if you got a full cool time system with these. Um, but if you're just running them for heating, probably once a year. About maybe five, ten months of grease. You don't want to over grease them. Right? If you can actually damage the bearing, I think it's five, five, five pumps on these four. And same with that bearing assembly. Um, another thing you want to check for is leaks. Um, these are mechanical seals. They're, um, I believe these are, these are the uh, silicone to silicone. Uh, the two faces are silicone. Um, what you want to do is check underneath here. You see water pool in this area here. And so you got yourself a seal leak. Changing the seals is actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Let's shut the door. Help me. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I mean, as far as greasing it about once a year, and then just checking you know, the seal leaks and then you know, the dust. Um, if you do start seeing that dust, it's usually one or two things. Either the motor's out of alignment, which at this point it probably shouldn't be, because I think people have already been aligned and started up. So more often than not, it's going to be you have a bad bearing somewhere. This is a, what we call a suction diffuser. It's basically there's a cross-shaped baffle that goes on the inside of that. And then there's a screen around that baffle that's going to take care of, you know, large particles in the water. Uh, there's no maintenance to that. Um, but uh, if you need to change the screen, you take the screen out. If you notice you're not getting enough flow in the system, uh, there's not enough to do. That might be one thing you want to check. Yeah. Uh, up here, this is what we call a triple duty valve. We call it a triple duty valve because it has three main functions. Uh, it acts as a balancing valve, which you can see here. If you tighten this down, you can actually reduce the flow uh, going out into your system. It's a positive shutoff valve, so if you tighten this all the way down, it basically just acts like a ball valve or a gauge valve. Uh, it's also a spring loaded check valve. If one of these isn't running, that check should close to prevent bad flow. Come in here, and you see one pump is running, and the other one is supposed to be off, and that's kind of okay with that group. Just check it out here. Um, I would recommend probably about once a year, just screw it all the right way down, screw it back out to, looks like these are all at 100%. But just tighten it down, tighten it back out. And sometimes, you know, it's, yeah. Sometimes the dirt in the system will kind of find that all up and uh, get sort of the issue. So, <clears throat> that's going to be your suction side, the water return. It'll come through here into your color eye. And, uh, and those inline pumps in the back are basically the same. The only difference is, is there's no coupling. The motor shaft is connected directly to the pump. There's only two ports on that, as far as grease goes, and that's just the motor. There's no bearing, there's no coupler on those. 
basically everything that we've done with these is pretty much the same with those with those exceptions. So it's just this it's just a certificate uh certificate. Okay to look at them back this year? You want to uh, come back and look at the Okay. Yeah, that's it. Move on to these drives. Uh, these are your DFOS drives. There are three different ways you can shut this drive off. Um, if you kill this main disconnect, you're killing power to this whole panel, except for whatever power is coming in the bottom of this disconnect. There's a selector switch here. You have drive, off, and bypass. And there's a test option as well. You don't have to worry about that test. That's usually just for us. This is so we can turn it to test and run it through a space without actually so, select the switches in off position, you're still going to have power to this bypass cabinet down here. Because the actual drive is just right up here. And then this is the bypass cabinet. So if you shut this off, you're still going to have power to the bypass cabinet, but you won't have power to this drive. And then you have an off button up here. Oh, so the relay is in here? Yeah. Okay, motor start. So drive off and bypass. When the selector switch is in drive, it's going to be looking for a signal from your building automation. I believe it's going to be a 0 to 10. So if it's receiving a voltage of 0, then it's going to run at its minimum speed. Uh, 10 volts is going to run at 100%. This is your main screen up here at the top. This top left here is going to be your signal coming from your building automation. Right now it's giving you about a 3 volt signal, so around 30%. This middle one is the amp drop. This pump is running and it's drawing about 3.2 amps. Uh, over here is just your power consumption that the motor is using. It's measuring kilowatts, so it's about 0.1 kilowatts is the actual power that this motor is running at. This large number is your hertz. We usually set these up for, I mean, they're set up to kind of, uh, instead of at percentage, it's going to run at its hertz. We can change it to percentage, but they're not the percentage. Usually not very accurate, so we run it off the uh, hertz. So 18 hertz is your minimum speed. Um, so if you're running it at hand and you run it down, try to run it below 18 hertz, it won't go anywhere below 18 hertz. So that's going to be your minimum speed. And then down here is just your kilowatt hours. And then this bottom line here is the status of your drive. Right now it's auto remote and it's running. It's in auto, which means it's looking for a start in a speed signal from your building automation. Uh, it's in remote, which is, again, it's looking for a remote start stop. And then running. The top four buttons up here, you have your status key. The status key just means if you're going in for some reason and going through your main menu or anything, you want to get back to that main screen. Get your status key and that'll take you back uh, to that main screen. Quick menu, uh, that just kind of holds your basic stuff, motor parameters, basic stuff just to get the drive up and running. Main menu that has all the fun stuff in it. Everything that this drive can do, all the parameters. Now, will you pick up trouble codes? Like if you're looking up one, two, and you uh, yep. trouble codes. Yep. Okay. So if you ever have, let's see, just really quick. I just threw it into an alarm. Mm -hmm. Your alarm light's going to be flashing. It's going to say auto remote trip. Means you have a fault, and up at the top, it's going to tell you what that code is. The external airline and A60 is a code, so you can go into your book. Okay, I'm going ahead and, and yeah. uh, reference. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you don't have a book on hand, you can hit this info button. That'll tell you what the alarm, what the alarm is, and kind of steps you go through. Oh, okay. Trying to figure out what that alarm. So there are two different types of alarms. There's this trip alarm. There's also an alarm called a trip lock. If you come down here and it says trip lock, that means something serious happened. Like okay, you lost the mains phase, or you lost the phase to the motor, or something detrimental to the operation of this drive. Okay. So you 
can't just hit this recent button once you fix it. It says trip lock. Trip lock. Trip lock. That means it's locking you out. You can't do it. You can't just hit the reset. The trip, the normal trip alarm, you can just hit that reset. And if everything's okay, it's going to start sending out. Probably, probably lost a leg of power. So what you're going to have to do after you fix it is cycle the power. Okay. Shut this drive off, wait for the capacitors on the inside to discharge. It shouldn't maybe take a minute or so. So once that screen goes blank, do we have fuses in there? Do we have fuses? And then once the power comes back on, you can hit that reset. Right, so it's probably just going to that engine, you probably would fix it or something like that. It's possible. Yeah. These are all your navigation keys. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These are your navigation keys. Uh, if you go into any of your menus or anything, you can press the back button, and that'll take you to the previous. There's, it's kind of like steps. So you go to a you go into like um, they're they're broken down into different categories. Like if you have this load and motor category, if you go into that, and it's got the different the next step in those uh, categories. If you go into one of those, then it has goes even further. It's like a tree. If you hit the back button, it's going to take you to one previous. So if you keep hitting the back button, it'll go back to this screen and back again. Take you back to your main screen. Uh, this info key again. Uh, if you go into any one of these, let's say I go into uh, motor power, and I don't know what that means, go ahead and hit the info key, and just like the alarm, it'll tell you what that parameter is. Now you shouldn't have to adjust anything with these parameters. The only thing that you will have to adjust is if this motor goes bad and you replace it with another one that isn't the same, that has a different RPM or has a different uh, amp draw, that's the only thing that you'll have to change. You'll have to come in here and change it. To do that, just go into the quick menu, go down to this quick setup, and that's where all your motor information is. You scroll down, motor voltage, motor power, and horsepower, okay. frequency, motor current, and your combo speed or your RPM. Change those, you'll hit OK. Some of these you can't change while it's running. So to change a parameter, you'll hit OK. And notice you'll have uh, this cursor here, this darkened cursor. The left and right arrows move that cursor. The up and down arrows change the value. If you're happy with it, hit OK. And that's it. Now, is, is all of that information inside that packet yes. right here? Mm -hmm. Now the buttons down here, uh, there are two different modes of operation. There's the auto, and then there's the hand. Auto just means, again, you're waiting for your building automation to start and stop. Hand means it's ignoring the building automation. If I put it in hand, that means I'm in control. So if you need to, if you have a problem with the building automation or something, and for some reason both of these pumps shut down, it's zero degrees out, and these are pumps running. Come in here, get the hand on. And again, just like changing a parameter, you've got this cursor here. It's a left and right arrow keys, up and down. Let's speed it up and slow. So we should never have to mess with RPMs. The only thing, like I said before, the only thing you'll have to change in there are the RPMs and the, uh, the motor change current. The motor, if right. you change the motor. But as far as the system is running, you should never have to. Speed That's pretty much it. I mean, you also do have a bypass. If you switch it to bypass, it's just like a cross lock. Now, with these ones, they do have what they call an electronic bypass. So, you, unless you're receiving a start command from your building automation, it won't start your bypass. That's the only real downfall to that. What's the accuracy of those two? It should be one for one for every day, so three fuses, right? Yeah, basically what's gonna happen So our power's gonna come in through here. 
going to go up over on this side. Mm -hmm. That's your power card. Mm -hmm. And then up at the top there is your fuses. Those are your three main fuses right. before it gets to this drive. Right. Now if you do it at bypass, it eliminates all of this and it just goes from your power source through your contact. Okay. I guess. So you do have three fuses up there and I believe they're 30 amp. Mm -hmm. These ones 30 are 30 amp. amp. Okay. Time in the fall time when the weather's kind of mild, you're not going to be running really high temperatures. Mm -hmm. This is your main controller in here. If you notice there is a backlight, so if you come up to these and you don't see a display, mm -hmm. just don't, don't panic. panic. Yeah, okay. Don't panic. Okay. Touch screen. Okay. Uh, this is set up uh, as a master follower. Mm -hmm. This is your master drive. All the information is going through uh, this boiler first. And this boiler is going to tell this one when to turn on, when to turn off, how fast, how slow, or uh, you know, as far as power, you know, how high, how low temperature it needs to go. So this is your master. It's not always going to be the lead though. There's a difference between master and lead. They will lead lag. So if you come in here and this one's running but this one's not, this one's still a master, but this one is actually the lead. Does that make sense? Uh, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, so I guess what I'm confused is, it's the distance, the master of the boiler. Should this, this, this boiler only turn on when this can tell it to? You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Okay, if this one is running, mm -hmm. and then we need uh, extra heat, then this one yeah, will send a signal that. to turn that yeah. one so on. So this one can't keep up the load, it will turn that other one right. on. Right, so wow. I guess what I'm confused is, why would this one be on and this one? Kind of equalize runtime. Oh, okay. okay. So this one's not always going to be running all the time. Okay. It's going to okay. switch back and forth between. Okay, the two. I got you. Okay. Do we have you on the same time? It's possible. If you get a really, really cold day, and this one, uh, like I said, can't keep up with the load in the building, it will keep this one on. And basically, what, it, what they're going to do is both kind of match their firing rates. So if one's running at like 100%, it's going to kick this other one on, and they're both going to run it on. It's not going to be like one running at 75 and one running at like 30. They're both going to run at the same, at the same uh, fire rate per second. So it will only trigger at 100? What's that? It will only trigger at 100? I believe these turn on about 90%. So yeah. if one of them gets up to 90%, then it's going to kick that other yeah. one. They'll both go to 45 or something. Right? Yeah. They'll both yeah. basically modulate until they so satisfy. They right. So this is your main display here. Up at the top, you have zero percent to one hundred percent. This is just going to be like kind of like a bar graph. It's going to kind of tell you what the firing rate is. It's kind of like a visual of the firing rate of the boiler. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll also kind of tell you a percentage uh, up in the top here. Mm -hmm. um, right here, it's going to tell you that this one is the master. On that second one, it's just going to say member. Uh, they do have specific numbers attached to them, just so they can communicate between the two. This is number one. This will be number two. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't have any demand. Mm -hmm. um, these are set up where they're running off an outdoor air reset curve, but there's also a warm weather shutdown temperature. Mm -hmm. So when the temperature outside reaches about 60 degrees, the boiler plant shuts down. Mm -hmm. This will tell you your outdoor air temperature, um, your header set point. Your header set point is actually going to be in that tank. Mm -hmm. So how these are going to run is actually they're going to they've been given a set point mm -hmm. as far as whatever the temperature is outside. They're going to try to maintain the set point in that tank. And that's your uh, actual temperature. So this will be the cascade header temperature. That's going to be the actual temperature inside the tank. The set point is going to be what we're going to try to maintain. You have your outlet temp, your inlet temp, and your exhaust temp. Uh, but that's just going to be for this boiler. Mm -hmm. Now at the bottom, we have our settings. 
Again, this has already been set up, so you shouldn't have to go in there. You have to go ahead and tap that settings. You got set up wizards, parameters, and all that other good stuff. To go back, you can either hit previous or you can hit this home key. The home key will take you back to this main screen here. Uh, this customize button, if you so choose to do so later, uh, you can hit that customize button. And you can actually show a different number of these on that main screen. Like, if I, like right now, the only three that I have activated are this air temperature, header temperature, and your set point. Now you can add other things onto this main screen. So where, where is the temperature, the temperature switch at? It's, it's, it's not in the board, it's got to be out here. It's a sensor. It's a sensor? Oh, okay. So that sensor is inside that tank. Oh, okay. And you have your info key here. I'm going to go ahead and hit that info key. It's going to tell you everything that the boiler is doing at this time. Right now our outlet temperature is 77, inlet temperature is 77. Heat exchanger temperature, your outdoor air temperature. Now keep in mind if you go into the information on your follower boiler, mm -hmm. it won't tell you what that outdoor air temperature is because the sensor is only wired to this point. Now if I go firing rate, fan speed, there's your status down here. Right now it's waiting for a demand. It's kind of hot outside, you don't need any heating, so obviously there's no demand. Um, you can set these up for different types of operations. If it's not set up for that operation, chances are it's going to say inactive, which just means it's not programmed to do that certain, uh, that certain feature. So this is all your uh, flame signals here, delay timers, and also have your runs. This is where you're going to see how many cycles it's run, how many times it's lit off, and all that other good stuff. Now with these, if you do see an alarm, it'll actually show up on this top up here. This will change to either orange or red, or yellow or red. Mm -hmm. Clear that alarm, you just tap it, it'll tell you what it is, kind of give you a little overview. Of Kind of like the drives, kind of tell you what to look for. Uh, so we'll go. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask this question. So there's no outside air uh, sensor for this board? For this one, yeah. yeah. So you have an outdoor air uh, right. temperature sensor on the outside of the building. That's okay, right. That's what, that's what I was. That's yeah. Okay. All right. Now you're only going to see that temperature here. You won't okay. see it on that other one yeah. because that one doesn't have anything hooked up. Now, for whatever reason, because these boilers are tied together, which means they're going to be talking to each other, for whatever reason, they lose communication or somebody shuts this boiler off, that one will go into an alarm, but it will also go into a standalone mode. This just basically means it's going to run off of, like if my set point was 145, and it loses communication with this master boiler, that one's going to run by itself and maintain 145. Until this one gets back up. Right. So you're, if this master boiler goes down, you're not going to lose heat to the building. Okay. The other one will kick on and it will run. Right. Take a look at the inside here. Right. Now we cook. Yeah. <laughs> this is the inside of your boiler. Down at the bottom is your uh, blower motor fan. These are your electrical connections, this is your high voltage, um, this is your low voltage, this is going to have all your temperature sensors Control. and things like that. Yeah. This is your main solar controller here. Mm -hmm. um, gas valve. Um, with these boilers, the gas follows the air. So the faster that blower spins, the more gas is introduced into the uh, combustion chamber. The combustion chamber is right here. mix at the uh, beginning of this fan here. Mm -hmm. It's going to mix with the air and go into your burner. Mm -hmm. Right up there. These are spark igniters. Mm -hmm. So there is no pilot or anything yeah. like that you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. All aluminum? No, these are actually stainless. 
Kind of security does make aluminum style boilers, but you don't have them here, so really. Oh, okay. it's the module. This is this is your main uh, burner control module. Okay. So this is going to control fan speed, your igniter, your ignition, and your uh, gas mask. It's like a PLC. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, since these are condensing boilers in the back, you do have. Well, before that, there is a few maintenance items. I don't know if you guys are going to do them, but. Uh, Annual maintenance is because these do not have filters on them. Okay. So those burners are going to have to be pulled and cleaned oh, okay. pretty much annually. To what do that, if they're not, uh, you can you can start seeing a lot of flame failures, flame failures, ignition failures. If you see a lot of that, chances are there's going to be a lot of soot build up. Not only soot, but whatever's you know that's pulling in from the outside air. Is it like a specialized cleaner or something that we can do in house? You can do it in-house. Mm -hmm. um, these burners are what they call mesh tube burners. So it's basically just a long tube and on the outside is like a mesh wrap. Mm -hmm. It just goes, it basically what it's doing is just evening out the flame. It's not like a regular flame like you would see coming out of a lighter or one of your older, you know, mm -hmm. clean boilers or something like that. It's actually more like a glow rod burner. I mean, you still see a flame, but it's pretty much even out throughout the whole burner. So what you'll do is you'll take this elbow here off. Mm -hmm. Got some bolts here, some bolts in there. Mm -hmm. Take that elbow out. That burner just slides right out. Mm -hmm. To clean it, just holds it down. Mm -hmm. This is a flame sensing rod right here? Yes. So we got to clean that too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might want to pull it out just to double check. So your flame sensing rod is right here. Your igniter is down here on this side. Pull those out, just take a look at it, make sure they're kind of clean. Um, with those, you don't necessarily have to replace it if it gets dirty. Um, so just take like a scotch pad yeah, or something like light emery. Little, uh, yeah. So you, you know, can sandpaper or something. You can take that whole unit out and hose it off. Yep. Dry it off, let it dry and slide it right back in. Mm -hmm. okay. Sometimes you don't even need to let it dry, just stick it back in there and <laughs> it'll dry itself off. Okay. The one thing you do if you do decide, if you do pull these burners, you need to be very careful with them. Mm -hmm. If you tear that mesh, mm -hmm. you're going to have big problems. Okay. So if you see any damage to that mesh burner, you're going to have to replace it. Okay. Because these do have a tendency to make loud noises okay. when that mesh is damaged. Okay. It's a loud one. So just be careful with that mm -hmm. now when you're looking at it. But yeah, don't use any solvents, don't use any like degreasers or whatever, don't use any wire brushes or anything like that, just the hose with a spray nozzle on the end of it, like you're watering your garden, put like a little jet on it, spray it down and make it cool. Power on and off in here. Um, most of the alarms on this you can reset just by using this controller here. You can reset from here, mm -hmm. so you'll see like the little alarm on the inside here on the top, it'll go into either red or yellow. Um, and it'll prompt you up at the top, just hit it to find out what it is and it'll ask you to reset it, you can reset it there. There is one manual reset that you cannot just reset on this, and that's your high temperature, which is right here. This is your high limit thermostat, mm -hmm. so if it ever gets that high where it trips that thermostat, you'll see a high level alarm or a high temperature alarm on here. You'll have to reset it here first before you reset it here. Now these are condensing boilers, so in the back you'll see there are what they call, what I call a box of rocks, which is just a uh, plastic container that has limestone in it. What that limestone does is it takes the acidity out of the condensate before you dump it down the drain. This way you're not pick it up before replacing those trains in a couple of years because they're all rotted out. Um, so as far as maintenance with those goes, just check them. Check the level of the rocks on the inside. We usually keep it about half full. Um, you shouldn't have to pull them out and wash them and change it. Just uh, add more as you need. I mean, if it starts getting really dirty and really crummy, then yeah, you're going to have to pull it out, wash it out. Pull the old rocks off, wash them off, and put them back in. Because if it starts
starts plugging in, that kind of thing's going to back up in your heat exchanger, and then the border's not going to fly. So, that's another thing just to keep an eye on. Uh, these do have low water um, capabilities. There is a uh, an electrode. So, if you start getting low water nuisance alarms, that's usually what it is. Isolate your boiler, pull that little electrode out, and again, do some wrap or a light emery or something like that. Just clean it off and stick it back in. Really, that's the only reason why you should ever go to a, into a low water with these boilers, because it is a closed loop, it's a closed system. 